Good evening. Welcome to Washington. I'm Brett Baer. Breaking tonight, President Biden promised a response to the deadly drone strike that killed three American soldiers in Jordan. He promised that would happen at the time and place of his choosing. The time was today just after he attended the dignified return of the bodies of those three Americans at Dover Air Force Base. The place, Syria and Iraq, and dozens of specific targets tied to Iranian proxy groups. We're still getting information about all of it. Iran was not a direct target tonight, likely won't be, but senior defense officials tell Fox this is just the beginning of a series of strikes. We have Fox team coverage. Rich Edson's at the White House looking at the President's Day and new reaction just out from the White House. Mike Tobin in Tel Aviv with what's going on in Israel and reaction from the region. And retired General Jack Keane here in Washington has his strategic analysis of these strikes. But we begin with Chief National Correspondent Jennifer Griffin. Security correspondent Jennifer Griffin at the Pentagon. Good evening, Jennifer. Good evening, Brett. We are told the U.S. aircraft involved in the strikes tonight are out of harm's way. The president had promised earlier in the week to respond to the deaths of three American soldiers. He said he had took the, he took the decision earlier this week. U.S. Central Command submitted the targeting list, a campaign, I'm told, to maximize pain for the Iranian proxy forces that killed U.S. troops with a suicide drone hitting their barracks while they were slept on Sunday. In a statement, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin said, quote, This is the start of our response. The president has directed additional actions to hold the IRGC and affiliated militias accountable for their attacks on U.S. and coalition forces. These will unfold at times and places of our choosing. We do not seek conflict in the Middle East or anywhere else, but the president and I will not tolerate attacks on American forces. We will take all necessary actions to defend the United States, our forces, and our interests. U.S. airstrikes began at 4 p.m. Eastern at <clears throat> excuse me, at seven locations in Iraq and Syria. According to senior U.S. defense officials, two B-1B Lancer bombers launched from the United States to take part in the attacks. The supersonic warplanes can carry the Air Force's largest conventional payload. U.S. Central Command said in a statement that its targets included Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps force. Quote, U.S. military forces struck more than 85 targets with numerous aircraft to include long-range bombers flown from the United States. The airstrikes employed more than 125 precision munitions. The facilities that were struck included command and control operation centers, intelligence centers, rockets, missiles, unmanned air uh, vehicle storages and logistics and munition supply chain facilities of militia groups and their IRGC sponsors who facilitated attacks against U.S. and coalition forces. U.S. officials have ruled out striking inside Iran at this time, saying they want to avoid a larger war. Defense Secretary Austin was asked about what he described as a multi-tiered response that could last days. I don't think the uh, the adversaries are of a one-and-done mindset, uh, and so uh, they have a lot of capability. I have a lot more, and, and so you know we, uh, we're, we're, as I said earlier, we're going to do what's necessary to protect our troops and our interests. Brett, three of the targets were inside. Uh, Iraq and four were inside Syria, we're told. Pentagon officials also say that for now, the U.S. does not plan to strike inside Yemen. That could change if the Houthis step up attacks. This first round of strikes will be contained to Iraq and Syria. Brett. Yeah, and as far as, Jen, you know, you had lawmakers like Senator uh, Lindsey Graham and Senator John Cornyn saying there should be strikes inside Tehran, inside Iran proper. No indication that that's going to happen, right? Absolutely. We've talked to U.S. officials. That is not in the cards in this first round of strikes. And the U.S., of course, would like to avoid a broader conflict. Uh, but again, the enemy gets a vo vote. And the problem is things could escalate and nobody's ruling anything in or out. Yeah. And last thing, Jen, you say this is the beginning and that's what they're telling us. Um, but we don't have any sense of you know, how long this is going to go, do we? I'm told it will be days, possibly weeks, but this is a campaign. It's a campaign that has been put together with targets um, by CENTCOM. You saw 85 targets tonight, um, and they're leaving out the Houthis. So if the Houthis decide to uh, escalate attacks, that's a whole, that's a, 
a different part of the campaign. So again, they're hoping that Iran and its proxies uh, get the message. We're hearing some reports that one uh, top commander of a proxy group in Ambar province was killed in the strikes. Okay, we'll continue to follow that. Jennifer Griffin live at the Pentagon. Jennifer, thank you. Let's find out what's going on right now in Israel, get reaction from the region. Senior correspondent Mike Tobin is in Tel Aviv tonight with the latest there. Good evening, Mike. Good evening, Brett. And despite the statement from uh, John Kirby, the NSC spokesman, that the Iraqi government was informed before these strikes that took place, uh, we're getting a different take from an Iraqi military spokesman who says the strikes uh, inside Iraq violate Iraqi sovereignty and threaten to pull the region into, quote, dire consequences. Many times we do have sources on the ground confirming that indeed uh, the area inside Iraq near uh, Al Qaim, which is by the western border of Iraq, very near the Syrian border, uh, was hit. You're starting to get some unverified videos uh, surfacing on social media <clears throat> showing the aftermath of those strikes. We also know that right across the Syrian border, just a short distance, uh, really about 60 miles away, uh, there are additional strikes in the Deir Azur area, Al Madin, Abu Kamal. Uh, what we know about these locations, they are command and control structures, at least according to CENTCOM, weapons bunkers, intel centers, and uh, logistics hubs uh, for the uh, Iranian proxies and for the Ira uh, Iranian revolution. Revolutionary Guard. Now, despite the telegraphing of these attacks, it was not a well-kept secret. Uh, everyone in the region knew they were coming. Uh, the Iranian proxies, particularly the Houthis, uh, were not intimidated. <clears throat> there was a rocket attack today uh, intercepted by Israel's aero uh, air defense system. And uh, shortly after that, a short time before we came to air with, uh, with this latest information about the attacks, the Houthis claimed responsibility for firing missiles, plural, in the direction of Israel. Brett. Mike Tobin in Tel Aviv. Mike, thank you. Let's take a closer look at what's happening right now in the Middle East. We've been reporting that these strikes came from multiple platforms, and there were 85 of them. Uh, it matches what we've seen, and CENTCOM putting out this statement that uh, there have been multiple strikes on Iranian proxy groups throughout Syria and Iraq uh, that comes, they did not strike inside Yemen, although there have been strikes there before, at least 12 strikes since January 11th, uh, command and control operations, intelligence centers, weapon supply chain facilities is what we're hearing so far in Iraq and Syria, air, sea, space assets even. Uh, if we know that the B-1B bombers uh, flew from the U.S., uh, we can confirm that, and that is a significant development because you, obviously you've got a plan from that. It either comes from South Dakota uh, over here or Texas uh, down here one of those two bases they haven't said specifically but you make the the trek across the world essentially over to Syria and Iraq to drop uh, these bombs the uh, interesting thing about the entire situation is that you've got uh, hold on one second let's get back here there we go um, a situation where you have multiple strikes and we don't have the specifics of exactly what has been taken out. We are, there's a criticism that uh, some of these things were in the middle of the desert and there's not a lot of back to them. I want to bring in retired General Jack Keane, our analyst here uh, at Fox. Uh, General, as you look at this map and you see what the CENTCOM put out, how do you think this is all shaping up? I mean, 85 specific targets is a lot. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. And the delivery of you know 125 precision munitions, bringing our B-1 bomber all the way from the United States because it's got precision bombs on it, but it's got heavy-duty bombs, and so that that's a significant capability. I mean, we're in a very early stages of this. I applaud the administration. This is going to go on for days and conduct a sustained air campaign. That's the right thing to do. And let's see what, what actually happens as a result of it. I do have some underlying concerns, certainly. The administration seems to be saying that they're not going to take out anything that's in Iran. It's not so much that it's the IRGC, so our audience understands, they fund, arm, train, direct, and provide intelligence to all of these proxies that are operating in the Middle East. And so they are a key center of gravity target. And the reason why you want to go to Iran is because that's where they are. That's where the capabilities are. That's where the units are. And that's where the leaders are. Uh, they certainly have some capability out in the region here, but it's limited. 
So those major targets, if you're going to take down the IRGC capabilities, are in Iran. You don't have to go after civilians to do it. A lot of it's on, on the coast to do it. There's Navy there. There's a training center. And there's also leaders that we, that we can deal with. My fundamental concern here is the administration is, expresses the view they don't want to provoke Iran into a wider war. That is the same assumption they made in dealing with Putin and why we provided half measures in terms of no advanced weapons. We didn't want to provoke Putin into using nuclear weapons, which he was brandishing. Two years into that, we know that assumption is flawed. It's not factual. And I believe this is the same issue here. So you have, you know, these are the strikes today, but you look over, you know, since October 17th, you have 166 attacks by these proxy groups, uh, various efforts to go hit U.S. forces uh, at bases in the Red Sea, uh, from Yemen, from all of these different groups. And General, uh, you know, the president said time and time again, don't, you know, don't do it. This is now a response to the three Americans who have been killed. Uh, but obviously, since October 17th, there's been a lot of activity. Yeah, I mean, there were 80 attacks before October the 17th during the Biden administration. So there's, there's been an unbelievable pattern. And when he said don't, they already did. We're not expanding the war. Iran expanded the war through its proxies in, in northern Israel. 80,000 Israelis displaced. The Houthi campaign disrupting 50% of the traffic through the Suez Canal and the Red Sea. That's an expansion of the war by Iran and the Houthis. And as you suggest, I mean, my God, 165 attacks. We should have been pounding them to prevent eventual loss of life, as opposed to doing something after the loss of life. Uh, now, as far as these groups, the Iranian proxy groups, when anybody says that we can't prove that Iran's behind this, you know, you look at uh, all of the groups around the region here. The Council of Foreign Relations, for example, 12 groups across six countries in the Middle East. Uh, you've got Hamas and Hezbollah, Hezbollah being the largest, uh, with 45,000 uh, in their ranks. But all of these little groups, is it fair to say, General, that they're not operating without the blessing or direction of the IRGC and Iran? Yeah. I mean, they don't control the day-to-day -day tactics of these organizations, just like we don't control the day-to-day -day tactics of our subordinate units. But are, are they overall in charge? Are they directing in a general sense? Yes. Are they arming, training, funding? Yes. This, is, this has been a brilliant strategy of the Iranians to use their proxies, Brett, that exist in foreign countries against Iran's principal adversaries. And that is the United States and Israel primarily. They want to drive the United States out of the region, weaken the state of Israel so much that people don't want to live there and it will dry up. That's what they're doing and their proxies are the instruments of that. And they get away with it because we don't want to provoke Iran which is a mistaken judgment. Last thing, General, and we are going to see some battle assessment, some damage assessment, uh, you know, as time goes on about what exactly uh, was, was struck. There was criticism early on that the early strikes really didn't do anything. There were ammo dumps that had plenty of time for people to get away. 85 targets, 125 precision guided um, weapons. Are we suspecting that this is gonna be significant? you know, as far as what is hit? Well, I, I hope the pattern here of the targets and the amount of weapons that are being used continues. And listen, I want this to succeed. I, I don't want to be right that we've got a false assumption here and Iran's not going to stop. Let's hope this succeeds. Our, after all, we, we've got pilots in harm's way flying these missions. We got troops on the ground that are likely going to get some kind of a, a reattack, and obviously they need to be protected. So let's see this mission to the end and make a fundamental conclusion at the end whether this was extensive enough and do we think there's any deterrence in this capability that we're executing here. Uh, we're just getting word from CENTCOM that they believe that everything they wanted to strike, they struck. Uh, they believe those those targets that they were hitting is what they went after. They also have told us that all of the aircraft, fortunately, have cleared uh, the area without incident. Uh, good so news. That, that is good news. General Jack Keane, as always. Yeah, great uh, talking to you. Thank you very friend. much.
As we mentioned, President Biden was in Dover, Delaware this afternoon, Dover Air Force Base, to see the arrival of the three American soldiers' bodies killed uh, in this week's drone strike. Let's get more on the President's Day and reaction from the White House. Senior National Correspondent Rich Edson is live on the North Lawn. Good evening, Rich. Hey, good evening, Brett. We're getting more reaction and response now from the White House. NSC spokesperson and coordinator John Kirby says the White House believes that these attacks were successful, though he says that the Pentagon is still going through its damage assessment, trying to figure out how much they hit, uh, whether or not, and how many militants they may have killed here. Uh, they're unsure of that number right now, and then the early stages of that. Um, they say that it is not a routine strike, that they are doing so to degrade the capabilities of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps in Iraq and in Syria. Uh, they also say, according to John Kirby, that the strikes have begun tonight and they will not and tonight, President Biden is back home in Wilmington, Delaware, after attending the dignified transfer of those three American soldiers who were killed on Sunday. It is that attack that led to the response that we're seeing in Iraq and Syria this evening. In his first and only comments since the strike, the president says in a statement that the strikes began this afternoon at his direction and that, quote, our response began today. It will continue at times and places of our choosing. The United States does not seek conflict in the Middle East or anywhere else in the world. But let all those who might seek to do us harm know this. If you harm an American, we will respond. The president began his day at his Delaware home before flying to Dover Air Force Base. He met with family members of the fallen soldiers ahead of the dignified transfer and then returning home. On Tuesday, the president said that he'd settled on a response. The White House had offered very few details beyond that. Officials did say the U.S. would initiate a multi-tiered response over a period of time. The administration has been under growing pressure to retaliate for the nearly 170 attacks from Iran-backed militias on U.S. positions in Iraq, Syria, and now Jordan. Congressional reaction is also beginning to come in. Republican Senator Roger Wicker, he's the highest-ranking Republican on the Senate Armed Services Committee, he called the strikes welcome but far too late. And quote, instead of giving the Ayatollah the bloody nose that he deserves, we continue to give him a slap on the wrist. The Biden administration spent nearly a week foolishly telegraphing U.S. intentions to our adversaries, giving them time to relocate and hide. House Foreign Affairs Committee Chairman Michael McCall says after a week, the strikes are long overdue and that the Biden administration must be decisive. This also follows a year of the administration trying to return the United States to the Iran nuclear deal. They've been under criticism from Republicans for that and an increase in Iranian oil revenues. Brett, back to you. Rich Edson live at the White House on the North Lawn. Rich, thank you. Let's talk now with the chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee, Virginia Democrat. Mark Warner. Senator, thanks for coming in. Thank you, Brett. Uh, first, your overall 30,000 foot reaction to what we saw tonight and what you know about the reaction to it. Well, I think it was appropriate for the president to act. We're talking about seven locations, over 85 targets. What will be the beginning of what I hope and will believe to be an extended campaign uh, that will not only go after the uh, Shia militant groups but also their Iranian sponsors in the region. Um, I do think it's really important, as some of my colleagues and others are saying, you know, let's go right into the heart of Iran. I remember a, a, a very thoughtful meeting I had with President Trump when he brought us all down after the takedown of a U.S. drone and actually left us all with the impression that he was going to strike Iran that day. He chose not to because of the implications of a wider war and literally took six months because he chose as a president of the United States should the time and place to extract the most harm and he took out General Soleimani which was the head of the Iranian Quds Force in Baghdad and, not you, backed, inside of, and you backed up that decision and I backed up that decision and I think again what I'd ask my colleagues to do is you know the president is striking back seven locations, 85 plus uh, hits, and more to come. Let's see how all this plays out. And uh, I wish our troops well in making sure that we send that message that the three American soldiers who were lost, 40 wounded in the attack in Jordan, cannot and will not stand. So what do you say, you heard Rich's report of uh, the criticism from people like Senator Wicker, uh, uh, House Chairman of uh, Foreign Affairs uh, Mike McCall, that this is 
too long, the criticism that it took too long from October 17th when all of these attacks I, started. I, I've actually heard concerns that in the last couple of days there were either weather concerns. I mean, I'm not going to micromanage when the president picks and chooses a spot to hit back. I know that there had been, and we've actually seen, that um, uh, some of these groups, they are funded by Iran, they are trained, but you know, oftentimes they go off on their own. I think a little bit we see that with the Houthis, and I, I do hope we will come back and hit the Houthis on command and control. I think we've been too reluctant to go beyond just their missile strikes. So knowing what you know, you think some of these groups are freelancing? I, I think there is... I think what you've got, and part of this is because of Iranians' ability to then say, oh, we didn't know the specifics. We should not let the Iranians off the hook. But I do think, in particular in the case of the Houthis, um, you, the Houthi leadership, I was just in Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Israel, bipartisan Senate intel trip, and the one thing, particularly about the Houthis we got is, these guys think they are higher in the religious hierarchy than even the Iranian leadership. So I do think the Houthis, we have not pushed back enough. I do think it's good that we and the British are doing that, 11 nations involved in that. And for those who say that, yes, there have been a number of these attacks against our forces, and we can relitigate whether we struck back hard enough, fast enough, I do think, you know, for example, the leader of one of these Iranian groups, was taken out in the city of Baghdad in a very forceful. That leader will never attack again. So, um, again, I might Previously have Previously or more. tonight? No, I'm talking about this Previously. was reported yeah, yeah, a couple yeah. weeks back yep. that you reported on yep. as well. Um, about the money funneling, though, you, you can confirm that the funnel of money goes to these groups directly from Tehran. Oh, listen, there is no question that... Iran has a network of funding, and I think it's one of the reasons why we need to look more into crypto and some of the ability to hide these funds. But we also have to acknowledge, um, and this has been in your, your reporting and others, um, taking a fresh look at all of these groups. I mean, in many ways, there were leadership in Israel that for a long time turned a blind eye to some of the money going to Hamas. That, at the end of the day, did not obviously serve anything. But specifically with Iran, when you hear criticism from former Trump administration officials or Republican colleagues on the Hill that the sanctions are in place but they're not being enforced and that's one of the reasons Iran gets this this influx of cash that then they can throw out to these proxy groups, what do you say? Brett, I have never seen under other words, Bush, Obama, Trump, Biden an ability to cut off all the Iranian funds that go to these groups. This is uh, Secretary Austin uh, just yesterday about Iran. Take a listen. We're not at war with, with Iran, but the Houthis, uh, I mean, their activity needs to come to a halt, and we will call upon Iran to, uh, to quit or to cease supplying the Houthis with, uh, with these advanced conventional weapons. There are others in the world that are watching this to see how, how serious we are about this, and we are serious. Every statement has the United States does not see conflict in the Middle East, does not see conflict in a wider war with Iran. Every statement that comes out of the White House, State Department, Defense Department. Uh, but the statement, don't, don't do it, that they said a number of times, it just didn't work. They, they did it. Let, let's, let's look at the Houthis in a moment. You're absolutely right. Um, frankly, I think even the Iranians are a little bit surprised by how aggressive the Houthis have been about disrupting traffic in the Red Sea that leads into the Suez Canal. I'm glad that we and the British and an 11-nation coalition have struck back. We've got every international right in terms of keeping a, a maritime traffic going. So I think we need to be ratcheted up against the Houthis. I think we have focused way too much on their ability to launch missiles and not enough on command and control. And let's face it, the Houthis are not very good at governing, but remember the Houthis withstood the combined military effort of Saudi Arabia and UAE for a few years. They, they've been able to take a punch. I think we need to increase the, the size and volume of that punch against the Houthis. Okay, but can you say that the initial effort to outreach to Iran is essentially a non-starter? It didn't work, and clearly they are advocating the demise of the U.S. I have never, I have, I'm aware of no actions in recent months, and you, I'm sure others will correct me, where there's any sense that, you know, in terms of restart of the Ar Iranian nuclear deal or other things. I also 
can tell you, having just been in region, I heard of no nation that said, all right, America, you go in and bomb inside of Iran now, and that's going to be better for a region that is in enormous chaos in light of what's happened um, post-October 7th. Where do you think this goes from here? Listen, what I pray and hope is that we will bloody their nose, uh, both in terms of Iranian forces in region, and that we will bloody their nose in terms of the Houthis, in terms of stepping back. I do think, for example, on there are a lot of nation states that frankly rely on a lot of the transport and commerce that goes through the um, Suez Canal. I'm frankly disappointed as well that the Chinese depend on that as much as any other nation in the world, and they, they have not stepped up. Um, but I think one of the things we need to be thinking about is how we also think about the day after in terms of Gaza, and that make sure that we have those, those Sunni nations you know, the UAE, Bahrain, um, uh, Jordan, Egypt, frankly, Saudi Arabia. I think we have a real opportunity to m move with Saudi Arabia, but Saudi Arabia is only going to move with us on a defense pact and recognition of Israel if there is a future for the Palestinians. This is where navigating a region that has been, frankly, in chaos for 80 years since you and I have been both around this stuff, there is no simple solution, uh, but thinking about how we do the day after because there may be this moment in time on what I hope and pray for, where we could have an actual alliance between those more moderate Sunni nations, Israel and the United States, to push back against the extremists, mostly Shia-driven leadership coming out of Iran. And you think that's the solution for Gaza? I think the solution for Gaza is we've got to take out the Hamas leadership, and I'm, you know, I'm a huge supporter of Israel. We're over 100 days in. Israel has only been able to knock out about a third of the Hamas fighters and only a third of the tunnels. There is not a solution here that also doesn't include humanitarian aid to the Palestinians in Gaza because my fear is if you have these numbers that 26,000 people killed, for every Hamas fighter you kill, are you creating two or three more future fighters because of this, this level of violence? Senator Warner, we appreciate you coming in on uh, breaking news tonight. Thank you, Brent. Fair and balanced joining us now, Arkansas Republican Senator Tom Cotton of the Senate Armed Services and Intelligence Committees. Uh, Senator, welcome. Uh, your thoughts on, on this night as these strikes have begun. Thank you, Brett. Uh, well, first off, I want to set, expect, express my admiration for our brave troops who carried out these strikes. I have little doubt that the pilots and their crews uh, had a tactical success tonight. I think it's an open question whether this will be a strategic success by which I would set the standard for whether these attacks on Americans and international shipping stops. I have serious reservations about whether it will be a strategic success for m numerous reasons. Just simply put, one example, uh, we let Iran's leaders hightail it back to Iran from Syria and Iraq. So I, I suspect we did not kill many key Iranian leaders in these regions. Uh, Joe Biden also has shown no indication that he's going to reverse his failed Iran policy, really 11 years of failed Obama-Biden Iran policy of trying to appease and conciliate and grant concessions to the Ayatollahs. As far as I know, he is still giving sanctions relief to Iran to the tune of billions of dollars, even after the October 7th atrocities. So while I don't doubt that this will be a tactical success tonight and in the days ahead, I have very serious reservations about whether this will be a strategic success. We'll know soon enough whether the attacks have stopped. Senator, you know, some of your colleagues, uh, Senator Lindsey Graham, Senator John Cornyn, have called for attacks inside Iran, maybe even inside Tehran. Um, are you one of those? Brett, we have to have a serious punishing response. I have not yet seen that response in the reporting that I've heard over the last couple hours. If you want to avoid a war with Iran, the way to do that is to strike Iranians and its assets hard. The way Donald Trump did in 2020 when he killed their terrorist mastermind Qasem Soleimani. The way Ronald Reagan did in 1988 when he sank half of Iran's navy. 
Ronald Reagan was asked if we were at war with Iran, he chuckled and he said, no, they wouldn't be that stupid. And in fact, they were not. And their attacks stopped. That's the way to avoid a war. The way to get into a war is the hesitant half measures that Joe Biden has implemented over the last three years. Well, would deterrence, we talk a lot about deterrence. Uh, clearly, Iran pushing these funds to Iranian proxy groups was not deterred over recent weeks, really since the beginning of October, um, in these attacks, more than 165 of them. Uh, how would you do it differently? How would do you think a Trump administration would do it differently? Well, Brett, let me say it's not just the 165 attacks since the October 7th atrocity in Israel. There were almost 100 attacks in the first two and a half years of the Biden administration. Secretary Austin admitted last year when I questioned him at the Armed Services Committee that there had been something like 75 or 80 attacks. And we had only responded four times, usually just blowing up empty buildings in the middle of the desert. It's little wonder that Iran, when you couple that anemic response with tens of billions of dollars in sanctions relief, has thought they could get away with these attacks. What President Trump did, and what he'll do again, is actually deter Iran. He killed their terrorist mastermind. He, cra he clamped down on the Iranian economy to the point they were almost running out of foreign currency reserves. Iran, like most people in the Middle East, understand one thing, force and resolution. That's exactly the opposite of what we've had for 11 years under Barack Obama and Joe Biden. Again, Joe Biden can reverse his policy. He can clamp down on Iran's economy as well. He can stop the flow of oil. He can stop giving them sanctions relief in addition to these strikes tonight, and I hope more strikes to come. I suspect he won't do that, which means Unfortunately, these attacks are likely to continue against Americans. We're just getting some word as we're speaking here. Um, this is coming from the ground in Iraq um, that three houses used as headquarters for uh, one of these Iraq militias that's backed by Iran uh, were targeted in Al Qaim, as well as a weapons storage area. Then an operation headquarters uh, in Askashat, uh, Iraq, also a weapons store uh, there, but Iranian-backed militias headquarters. We, again, to your point, have not heard of senior officials, um, IRGC officials, as of yet, uh, having been targeted on this. But CENTCOM saying of the 85 targets, they believe they hit every single one that they were going after. 